Fight Fest, day four. How's it going? Is it good? Hey, about half of you good. Um, I guess that means the rest of you are bad, wicked, or possibly deranged. I am true. Now, this next person knows who he is. Picking your shoes and socks off during the film is not acceptable. So, no shoes and socks, but what about pants? Uh, well, 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 actually, uh, Jason Isaac a couple of years ago has dropped his trousers famously. Yeah. And just as well, he washed his pants. <laughs> All right, so you hear that? We can take our pants out of there. This is like church on a Sunday morning, right? It's good, we're here for mass, for, for God's day. And, uh, and that's it, I'm gonna... Are you repenting for your sins of last night? Oh yeah. M many of you I'm sure I saw just a couple hours ago at the Phoenix. <laughs> Every year I stand on this stage and tell you that I have an absolute favourite movie. This year I, I just love Dark Tourist. I'm delighted to have the director, Sorry Kashama, here and my absolute favourite TV star, Officer John Cooper from Southland. Hear me? Yes. Yeah. You first? I can hear you. Me first? You first. I want to say a huge thank you to Mike for coming over from Los Angeles. He literally arrived here uh, this morning. <laughs> I was sent the script in the sort of traditional way through. I mean, it landed on my inbox. I fell in love with it immediately, but it wasn't really that that pulled me in. What it was was the conversation that followed the following morning with Frank John Hughes, the writer. Mm. And I realised quickly, so quickly, the conversation was three hours long, really. But I realised quickly. conversations with Frank. <laughs> they do tend to be, if you know Frank, yeah. But I was in London, he was in LA. Actually, I paid for the call. Did you? <laughs> <laughs> you should have skyped. <laughs> yeah, so, yeah. I mean, grief tourism is a very weird it, sort of. It is, and it and it, it takes on its many different levels. We were all grief tourists to some degree. The Tower of London. Yay! <laughs> <laughs> well, take my picture. It's not good shit going on there, and we all do it, you know. Um, and I take it all the way down to putting your hands in Roman's Chinese theater in. The dead movie stars and prints. Okay, really, in the dead stars. Hand. I mean, when you really start <laughs> to dissect it, it falls apart. You know, that's not grief um, tourism. No, no, no but but it, but it's but it's connected to those things like um, fascination with um, you know going to Graceland. Most people, when you visit Ground Zero, you're not going to oh cool, let's go see where the towers came down. <laughs> you're paying homage. It's a respect thing. That's where I think the turn is with Jim. Mm. It, it's most people don't go for the same reasons. Most people are not retracing the steps of a serial killer. But there's an element of the grief tourism, you know, mm. in, in everybody. We have a TV series in America called Holliston. And it's a hit. Holliston is my favorite thing out of everything I've ever done. It is so fun to do. I mean, it's like doing theater. The fact that you get to get up in front of an audience and, and perform like that is just, it's, it's amazing. And to take horror icons like John Landis and Tony Todd and Kane Hodder and Daniel Harris and have them doing comedy in a sitcom with a laugh track and the whole thing, they never thought in a million years they would ever get to do something like that. And they're great at it. We had no idea if it would work, but lo and behold, the morning after our second episode had aired on television, we had a second season order. And so the second season just finished in America. It's coming here soon. On Sunday, that'll be the first time that a UK audience gets to actually see any of it. And like, don't tell anybody, but I'm, I'm actually more excited about that than Hatchet 3. But... This is your debut feature mm -hmm. after you've directed several shorts. How did it come about? I, you know, found myself at 2 a.m. in my pajamas watching my third back-to-back -back conspiracy film off the internet and just realizing I, you know, had developed a problem. So I, uh, I, the light bulb just went off at one point and uh, I just uh, realized how interesting the people are that believe the conspiracy theories and also the theories themselves. You know, some of them are ludicrous and hilarious. It's just this sort of mishmash of sort of forbidden truths and like lunacy all at once. I wanted to recreate that feeling for the audience, you know, watching the film. That feeling of sitting in your pants at 2 a.m. staring at the internet, not knowing what's real and what isn't. Exactly, that should yeah. be on our poster. <laughs> if you want to feel this. Yeah. It seems that you modeled the Tarsus group mainly on the Bilderberg group. I based it partially on the Bilderberg group, but also partially on this group called the Bohemian Club. The Bush family are members, uh, Nixon was in it, Reagan was in it. They really do meet once a year and they perform a pagan ritual in the woods. And there's a giant owl and they light this body on fire in effigy and it's, it's all quite creepy and weird. Freemasons, Bohemian Club, uh, any of these sort of secret groups that actually do exist in the world I find fascinating. You did set the film up as a, as a mockumentary. 
as mm -hmm. opposed to a found footage or a straight kind of fictional narrative. I definitely wanted to blur the line so that, you know, you didn't think it was real, but after you watched the film, you wanted to go online or do some research or to figure out, you know, is the Tarsus Club real? Is that person real? Is Mithraism real? The Tarsus website, we set that up well before the film. Um, and since the film opened in the U.S., uh, we've been averaging about 30 emails a day to that website of people who think it's real. Can I join? Yeah, well, <laughs> I'll, I'll show you the handshake later. This is the 666 Shortcuts to Hell competition. And we had 157 entries to this, and there were some sensational bits and pieces in there. Do we need to drum roll? Okay, we need now, a drum roll. The winner is, and Emily's just found out <laughs> one minute ago. And the winner of the uh, 666 Shortcuts to Hell competition is oh, the six feet under the necrophilia It's about a girl that falls in love with a dead body. That's, that's, that's it, that's it. And this is the real chair, because that's pretend. Oh, okay. <laughs> it just feels, feels great, it's an amazing cinema. Uh, it sounded really good, it looked quite good. I think, yeah, it's, it's well, everything I would hope for, really, in the future. I hope someday I will have another film here, that would be great. Please join me now in welcoming director Jeremy Lovering to the stage to introduce In Fear. It's about two people who don't know each other longer than two weeks, they go away together, and it's about whether the trust can be built or whether it's eroded. The movie's about three people who get very lost and very frightened. Uh, in Ireland, and uh, I don't think no, that's the most terrifying thing. <laughs> Alan, how did you feel to play a diabolical representation? Uh, really nice. Um... Thematically, it's about fear as a state of being and how that leads, possibly inevitably, to violence. Alan actually, his job during rehearsal was to sit at cafes across the street and watch us. That was your job. Yeah. Yeah. I still do it sometimes. Yeah. <laughs> the way we filmed it was I didn't give the actors a script um, and I didn't tell them the story. So much of it is about them not knowing what's coming next. We wanted to make something that was did find these horror beats but came from a very um, a place that was very human. I have an insight which I'm aiming for, but the, how the actors get there, I have to let them find their own way. As a kid, I used to find comfort in going in, you know, I'd walk into a forest and sleep through the night. Um, so, oh no. Okay. Yeah, deliverance. Okay. Yeah, yeah, great, great, great. You guys didn't know that when you signed up to work with him, did you? No. We genuinely love him so much. Um, he was really kind as well, you know. Um, which maybe is a bit creepy, like that he managed to be so. <laughs> well, he's pretty sadistic, let's be honest. He, took, he terrified three time. people. Big thank you to Frightfest. It's incredibly exciting to be here. It's a chance to see the film myself on this big and iconic and sadly soon to be dismantled screen. You can play on TV. Yes, you can get a similar experience watching it on your own in your house. But I think for me, I wanted to do something which primarily works in the cinema. I'd love to take a, a pass. I hear you can do a weekend pass and just have the bejesus scared out of me every day. <laughs> We've had the misfortune of not being able to see anything but our own film. Like, yeah. I'm just working a lot at yeah. the moment. Maybe we could nip out and go into something else. Yeah. Hey, Jeremy um, would hate us. Our learned colleague behind the camera would like to know if you can tell us anything about Sherlock. Uh, yeah, he's, he's actually being played by a woman. So, <laughs> there we go. It's all changed. director of I Spit on Your Grave 2, Stephen R. Munro, and the star of the film, Gemma Dallander. Hi. What can audiences expect from the film? They can expect to be disturbed, that's for sure. Mm. It is more intense than the remake, so they have that to look forward to <laughs> if that's what they're going to be looking forward to. How did you kind of try and differentiate this from the... Well, you know, n not much. Visually, I kept it very similar. Story-wise, we kept it similar because it is technically it's only part two. I feel that franchises should should have a similar visual style to it mm -hmm. throughout. It would be like, you know, watching the Bourne movies and then all of a sudden everything's done on static camera, <laughs> you know. Are you a horror fan yourself? Are those the films you enjoy or um, I, I enjoy any any <laughs> film that's um, thought-provoking and and so if it happens to be a horror film, then yes. And how was it working with Stephen? That, that oh. sucked. <laughs> no, it didn't. Don't be silly. 
What was it that drew you to this film in particular? Well, working with Steven, first of all, I, I knew him before we met and I met him, I read the script, <laughs> I read the script, you said 20. <laughs> it was only 10. All right. Uh, <laughs> Enjoyed working with you, Steven. <laughs> And I'll probably get in trouble for laughing because then people will go, oh, he thinks it's funny. But when, when you're so close to it like we were and you go through it, yeah. Gemma could probably go, oh, and after that one rape scene and we can remember something and smile and then everyone takes it as the, the wrong way. I've gotten in trouble before. People going, oh, hey, the director must have thought that was funny that that happened to that actor. I'm like, no, it's not. It's, mm -hmm. it's You're in such an intense situation with people that you grow very close to yeah. for such a long time it's like a family you know yeah. mm. so that's why we laugh sometimes yeah.